Greetings, I'm Janine Wiener Kronisch, anesthetist in chief at the Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm surrounded by the OR of the future in the Lunder Building, which will open in the summer of 2011. These high-tech tools will provide increased quality and safety for our patients. It wasn't always the case. You have to go back to October 16, 1846, to truly appreciate how far we've come. The pivotal moment in the history of Mass General is the public demonstration of anesthesia. And when you think about the impact that that's had on human suffering, there probably isn't another event of that magnitude that can be identified cleanly in the history of medicine. The use of ether revolutionized the way we took care of soldiers in the Civil War. It allowed surgeries to take longer so that more complete surgeries could be done, amputations could be done without pain. So ether was delivered by various people, including secretaries and interns, and there was no coordinated effort to systematically give ether or analyze how ether was uh, affecting patients. For various reasons, anesthesia wasn't a department. It grew out of pharmacology departments here at the MGH. It was part of the surgery department. And it was, if you will, just an instrument of surgery. Henry Beecher came in the 1930s and was, if you will, the first scientific giant of anesthesia at the MGH. He was very clever and he knew what he wanted and very quickly turned anesthesia into something important. He made himself indispensable. So although he was a clinician, he did research in at least four different areas, any one of which would be enough for an academic career nowadays. The, the output that he had was truly staggering. Uh, Beecher set up the first laboratory of anesthesia. It was unheard of to have an anesthesia laboratory at that time. He became famous for for the research that he did on things that changed the way people perceived pain. As a part of that, he really rediscovered the placebo effect. People knew there was such a thing, but he made a science of it. In 1954, Beecher and uh, Donald Todd, who ultimately was the vice chairman of the department at Mass General, published the first big study of the risk of anesthesia and surgery, the mortality and the morbidity. Uh, it was a multi-center study and the first time anyone estimated what your chances were of dying if you underwent surgery. Much of the work that Beecher did has meaning well outside the boundaries of anesthesiology. And he'll be remembered for the next hundred years as one of the notables in anesthesia. I don't think there's any doubt in the 200th anniversary of MGH that Dick Kitts is really an important player. He was here for 26 years. During that time, he uh, fostered and enabled the development of uh, the leadership of anesthesia throughout uh, certainly the entire United States and many parts of the world. He created a very strong research base, but I think he also created this important culture this culture of creativity and innovation. He saw that research was absolutely critical to the growth of the specialty, not just for its respect, but to really make anesthesia better and safer. Dick Kitts was responsible for creating the Anesthesia Bioengineering Unit. He established an engineering group to help create technologies to support the researchers. We did the research and the development to develop what was probably one of the first microprocessor-based medical instruments the Boston Anesthesia System that was intended to make anesthesia safer. A few years after I came here in the late 70s, anesthesia was among the most expensive specialties for malpractice and now it's among the lower ones. And people generally believe that this came out of the patient safety work and you can trace that back to this basic research of understanding how mistakes were being made. Instead of trying to defend the lawsuits and to create new laws to prevent payouts, anesthesia, and again, basically coming back to this basic idea here, really cared more about not hurting people, not making mistakes. And that happened during the era of Dick Kitts and started really all here at Mass General from those, that research. We owe a debt of gratitude to Nathaniel Sims, who helped evolve some of the safest equipment we use today. Uh, most folks know that hospitals everywhere have focused on 
on pain management uh, for patients uh, in the hospital. And the idea was that uh, uh, no patient should have uh, unnecessary pain, that we will not be there yet in terms of optimum uh, care of painful conditions until we have a portable uh, stick-on patch that is an accurate monitor of respiratory uh, rate in patients receiving uh, uh, opioid drugs. Uh, there are, fortunately, in the last uh, two or three years, uh, brand new technologies. One is acoustic, uh, one is uh, one that we've worked on ourselves, and, and, and others involve highly portable end tidal carbon dioxide. But we hope that two or three years from now, every patient receiving intravenous narcotics as a general care patient will not only be receiving the benefit of the drugs, but also be monitored in such a way that there can be no, uh, no untoward uh, side effects of those drugs uh, that aren't uh, detected. As, as you know, we're the pain team, yeah. right? And we've been trying to help with the, the pain you're having. So just tell me a little bit about what it feels like. Pain clinics really arose out of anesthesiology. Uh, anesthesiology, as you can imagine, uh, the central tenet of what we do in the operating room is relief pain. We also have a research realm which has uh, very active laboratories looking at the basic mechanisms that are underlie the development of chronic pain and how we might develop more effective pain medications. In fact, the last 10 years have told us a lot about exactly what causes pain, the neurologic mechanisms, and we're just starting to get a handle on how we might impact those mechanisms. But what we do in the clinic every day and the way that we control pain is really using the same drugs that have been around for tens to hundreds of years. And we're starting to understand how we might insert new and novel treatments that will really impact on the development of chronic pain, slow down the progression of diseases so that pain does not occur. And once it's in place and well established, we may be able to impact it much more successfully. The Clinical Operations Committee met yesterday to talk about this whole issue of trying really? to... The uh, critical care enterprise here uh, at the MGH was one of the first in the country and, and owes a great debt to the founder of critical care at the MGH, Dr. Henning Pantopidin. He was uh, one of the early advocates uh, in this hospital for what we now call the quality and safety initiative or quality and safety imperative. He recognized the need for a special unit staffed by specialists in respiratory therapy uh, and what we now call critical care intensive care, thereby co-locating those individuals, significantly improving their safety because they could be observed constantly by the talented uh, physician, nursing, and respiratory therapy staff there. And we're very focused on improving the healing for the entire group and figuring out ways to get those patients who we know today are not going to heal in the future to be able to provide new therapies, new approaches to those patients healing. Mm, this is what the first patient at the Mass General was anesthetized with. Came here in 1970 from the National Institutes of Health and I had been working on ECMO machines, extracorporeal membrane oxygenators or artificial lungs and I'd been using them at NIH and we figured out that artificial lungs were great for little people, newborns, little two and three kilogram babies with respiratory failure and they weren't so good for adults. So we worked on it in many ways, first with ECMO machines, later on by developing a therapy that actually was better than ECMO that in fact replaced my first 15 years of research by breathing small amounts of a very newly discovered simple gas. That gas was nitric oxide, which was known as a pollutant and a poisonous gas until about 1988 when people figured out that it was made in your body from arginine and therefore we had a poisonous gas that was made in your body from arginine that it was used as a common signaling agent. And so we got to the idea that well maybe if you just gave a teeny tiny dose of it and breathed it, it would stay in the lung. It wouldn't dilate the blood vessels in the body and would only dilate the blood vessels in the lung. That's essentially what we did. We tested it first in sheep here in our laboratory. We convinced ourselves that it worked. We convinced the FDA. We then did the first baby in the world to breathe nitric oxide here in 1990. Sure enough, we took a blue baby it breathed a few breaths of this gas and it turned pink. Since that time, 
I think about a third of a million Americans have breathed nitric oxide for five days, and in many cases, it saved their lives. So I first got interested in seals in the mid-70s, 74. People can hold their breath only for two or three minutes uh, if you breathe air. And uh, somebody said, you know, there's a seal in Antarctica that holds its breath for an hour or an hour and a half. And it's warm-blooded like we are and has all these amazing adaptations. And I didn't really believe him. But I said, that's interesting. And I read more about it. And I said, sure, they, they do. In fact, seals have dived for about up to 90 minutes. And they dive that way because they have to get under the ice sheet and catch fish on the bottom. And in Antarctica, due to constant glaciation, it's uh, 600 meters down to the bottom of the ocean. So they have to hold their breath long enough to go down 1,800 feet. And we still study that in my laboratory now. We try to understand how they can hold so much oxygen and get it to the right place at the right time. This year, for the first time, we carried back blood from the seal to have its genome sequenced at the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard. So I think we're just sequencing the genome of an extraordinary diving animal, a diving submarine that dives pregnant for an hour and a half. So there's a submarine inside the submarine and it dives for an hour and a half. The genetics of how that animal has adapted, I think when compared to humans may give us some clues. So no, we're not there, but there's lots of work to do for the next generation. Thank you for allowing me to speak of our achievements since the demonstration of ether. Our goal is to continually advance the field by improvement in medical care using basic research and clinical research as our foundation. Thank you for watching.